Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. I am a member of this museum and have been for, for many years. And I have helped uh, occasionally uh, with programming and been to some of the other uh, sites that are managed by this museum to do some reenactments. And it's always a, a pleasure and a thrill. And uh, so I'm from Montgomery County, to the south of here, uh, in Rockville. The Montgomery County Historical Society uh, has a couple of museums, two museums actually in Rockville, one of which I'm going to show you a bit of today, the Stone Street Museum of 19th Century Medicine. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So I'm going to introduce you to a, a historic person that probably you've never heard of. Uh, he was a, a local country doctor in Rockville in Montgomery County, he got out all around into the county the latter half of the 19th century, uh, serving his patients. He was one of those people back then who would have been what we call today the first responders. They didn't call it that then. But when there was an accident or a, a problem at the railroad depot or whatever, someone would send for the sheriff or the police and get the doctor to come to the scene. So that's what we'll look at today. Make sure I can get this correct here. There. And I thank this museum for the opportunity to once again uh, be here uh, as a member and an interpreter to, to help with some education. Sometimes I find myself, when I'm out and about in the county offering programs, depending on the, the venue, uh, sometimes it appears that I am the entertainment for the day, which I don't mind as long as I have an opportunity to teach about history. And, uh, bring things into perspective. So I thank this museum once again for this opportunity. And my local organization calls itself Montgomery History. We are not really quite a historical society where people sit around and talk about history. We're out in the community. Montgomery History is out in the community offering history. The Speakers Bureau that Chris mentioned does about 150 programs a year in, in around about Montgomery County, sometimes in the Prince George's, sometimes in Virginia, DC, Carroll County and other places, as requested. Um, with, uh, we have a, a league of local historians and authors who like to go out, take history out into the community, especially taking it to places where people might not be able to get out for themselves, and we'll take the history there. So this is what I'd like to do today. It looks like a lot, but I think we can move through this, and uh, I might put some of it in abatement depending on how we do. I want to introduce you to Edward Stone Street, who was this person that you're hearing about today? Uh, his story is really an American story, not just a story about Rockville or Montgomery County or even Frederick, although he had some connex tie connections to Frederick, which I'll explain. A little bit about his three roles, medical roles during the Civil War as examining surgeon, and then surgeon uh, helping with the wounded after the Battle of Antietam, and then uh, a bit after that helping uh, one of the, uh, the companies of uh, cavalry with the Michigan Brigade, who were in, in and around about the federal city in 1863. And I did some scanning of some, some documents from the National Archives from the Civil War surgeon's file about Edward Stone Street. You can go there and actually call up the files of certain people or doctors. And so I, I, uh, it was kind of kind of blew me away to be, to be doing that and holding the original documents in my hands while I was researching Edward Stone Street. And I'll show you some of those. Um, a little bit about some legacies through time, um, which you may know about, but we'll, we'll uh, talk a little bit about that because of what it meant uh, in Rockville. And a little bit of then and now throughout. I've got some, a lot of old pictures and some newer ones. Um, and then I'll talk a little, a little bit briefly about one of the things that stimulated me uh, to do uh, Civil War reenacting, not just 19th century doctor reenacting, but Civil War was my own army service. And I'll, I'll show you a bit about that just because. Then a couple of his patients later in the century, and if there's time, I'll introduce you to the, the little museum that uh, bears the doctor's name. And this is what it looks like today, the Stone Street Museum of 19th century medicine. This little place probably would fit in the foyer downstairs where the, where the, the bookshop is and other things. It's, it's a one-room standalone doctor's office. That is a small museum with broad message, and we'll, we'll get there. This is what it looked like in the latter 1800s. This is probably 1880s to 1890s, more or less, with the doctor's home in the background. He had a, a large three-story federal-style brick home, oh, quite, quite a nice place. 
in Rockville, right in center, center of Rockville. If you know, if you, anybody here know a little bit about been to Rockville, where the town center is? Well, we are about a five minute walk from the town center in that old part of Rockville. And this is he, Edward Elisha Stone Street, 1830 to 1903, or maybe I should say 1903. When he died in Rockville in the fall of 03, he was the oldest native man in Rockville at the age of 73. We now know, knock on wood, that's the new 40, right? <laughs> this, this photo was 1885. The doctor and Mrs. Stone Street were very lucky, having six daughters, they all grew up to be, and this was 1877, 1885 again, the, do, the, the, the daughters were all uh, intelligent, educated, well-schooled, and very involved in the community in many ways, particularly through their church, and teaching church school, singing in the choir, being choir director, playing music, and getting out into the community. Dr. and Mrs. Stone Street. This was 1896, um, a family reunion of sorts, with the daughters and their husbands, and a few of the grandchildren. Now this is the doctor here. His wife is over here. This is the doctor's mother. And I, I think what happened here was it was getting close to mom's birthday and a lot of, a lot of the family was in town because several of them lived, lived out of town and lived in North Carolina and other places and they were all around. So there was a family reunion. This got written up in the Washington Post back then in 1896 about this gathering at the Stone Street home. And these are a few of their 22 grandchildren. One of those grandchildren was, was named Barrett, Elijah Barrett. And in the, he was, uh, became a lawyer, as did some of his children. And the, uh, one of the uh, buildings in Washington, D.C., part of the city government, is the, uh, is, is the courthouse named for, for Barrett. This was the Rockville Academy, probably in the 1860s, plus or minus. Um, a small school that could, that could teach about 60 people. A very good private school with a high quality education. Some of the things I've read about this say that the education on this, this school through the secondary years was equivalent to the first year or two of university. It was that good. And I've got some information on that. If you, we could talk about that later if you like. And then this man, this, this man was named Magruder, William Bowie Magruder, MD, in Brookville, Maryland. And Dr. Magruder had a connection to the church in Rockville where the Stone Street family worshipped. The pastor of the church, his wife, was a Magruder, and Dr. William was her brother. So when young Edward Stone Street was thinking about um, a life as a physician, he contacted, through the church, made a contact with Dr. Magruder, who then took him on uh, as an apprentice after he finished his secondary education. And that was about 1848. During that time, if you were thinking about being a, a physician, a surgeon, a pharmacist even, as an MD, you began your training as an apprentice with a, a local doctor. Hopefully you could find one who was good and was a good teacher mentor, which Magruder was. During his lifetime as a physician, he had taken on five apprentices, Edward Stone Street being one of them. The apprenticeships typically lasted two to five years, plus or minus, and when the doctor thought the student was ready, he'd help them to enroll in, in a medical school. And that's what happened with the young, uh, young Edward. Uh, he, was, he went to Brookville and lived with the, the doctor on his farm, the Oakley Farm in Brookville. He lived there. He paid for this, of course. And he was tutored by the doctor. He read the doctor's books. He went on calls and emergencies and whatever with the doctor. It was the hands-on part of, of becoming a physician then, which in medical schools today is, is later in the training. But, but then you started as an apprentice and that you learned what it was like and how to be a, a physician and learn, learn the ropes and what it took to be a country doctor being out and about at all hours of the day and night, all seasons of the year, uh, serving your patients. Now, when he, Magruder, uh, was an apprentice, 
And this one, that was in the 1820s, before he went to medical school. He served as an apprentice with a man named Tyler, Dr. John Tyler from Frederick. Tyler was a well-known physician uh, and, and specialized in, in the diseases of the eyes and the ears and would, take, he would, would receive patients from as far away as Philadelphia. So he was a known quantity. And Magruder was fortunate to come under the tutelage of John Tyler. Another thing about Tyler, Tyler, John Tyler was a friend of Thomas Jefferson and a member of the Electoral College and cast a vote on Mr. Jefferson's behalf in the election of 1804. So I like to say maybe, I don't know if it's appropriate or inappropriate, but I like to say that Edward Stone Street knew someone who knew a friend of Thomas Jefferson. Just because. But he was, a, he, he was as nice a guy as he looks in this photo. This photo I received when I was researching all of this, I got from, from his family. And this was the medical school, still is the medical school, actually, in Baltimore, the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Lombard and Green Streets, not far from the ballpark, not far from the, uh, from the harbor. And this medical school is where Dr. Magruder studied as uh, he was class of 1827. The medical school opened in eight, 1812, if I recall correctly, and it wasn't too long ago that it celebrated 200 years. Davidge Hall, as it's called, is the oldest building in America that has been in continual use training medical students. I still do lectures there. In, and I think maybe just because, because of the history. But you can visit there, it's very museum-like if you go in. And one of the things that happens in there now is that it's the, uh, the Medical Alumni Association has their, their offices in there. But you can, you can uh, wander through and see some of the old catacombs. You know, back in the day, and back in the 1800s, uh, in many cities in America, uh, it was both illegal and unethical to use real cadavers to teach anatomy to medical students. They didn't have that. The city of Baltimore went through that and they, they, they uh, settled that matter. So during the lifetime, the early lifetime of this medical school, they used real cadavers. This school was ahead of its time. When it was founded, it was founded by a couple of professors who had studied in Europe, in Edinburgh. Edinburgh, Scotland, where was part of the, the seat of modern medicine of the day. And so when they came to America, they founded the university there on what they thought was the European standard. Part of that had to do with the, uh, the large, one on top of the other, uh, lecture halls, big circular lecture halls. One was called Chemistry Hall and the one was Anatomy Hall, where, where a couple of hundred students could sit around and lecture or watch demonstrations. Uh, they also uh, used real cadavers to teach anatomy. They required the students to uh, participate in autopsies so they could learn, follow what's going on in the autopsy meeting, you know, see it for yourself, what happened, and learn from that. They required the students to be proficient in, in clinical work, and they had to demonstrate that uh, before they could graduate. Um, they required the students to uh, conduct a doctoral thesis. It could be a research project or a clinically focused project. And Edward Stone Street took the clinical route. They also, they, University of Maryland School of Medicine claims that it founded the idea uh, of a medical residency. Uh, today, medical residency comes after you finish medical school. Back then, it was during the medical school training. So Edward Stone Street was one of a few students uh, who was uh, permitted, because of his, his stature in, in the academics, to be a resident in Whoops, what did I do? Yes, to be a resident in a teaching hospital, which was right across the street from the medical building. This was the Baltimore Infirmary. And this is around the 1850s or so. It was the largest hospital in the city of Baltimore, 150 beds at the time, teaching hospital. Uh, many medical schools in America did not have teaching hospitals, but it was part of the European standard that the professors wanted so that they could immerse their students in clinical work. And those like Edward, who were residents, lived in the hospital. 
took his meals in the hospital, was there around the clock with the patients when he other, wasn't otherwise doing what might be required of a medical student. So he was, he was immersed in the, in the training of the university uh, at that time. And part of the requirements for graduation, you had to demonstrate your ability in clinical work. You, you were tested uh, before graduating. You had to have your doctoral thesis approved before graduating. And you had to have a vote by the faculty a majority of the faculty vote in your favor. There were seven faculty members at the time, uh, and about when in Edward's class there were about 70 medical students, more or less. And uh, Edward, uh, Edward's vote was seven in his favor, seven to zero. He graduated with distinction, the class of 1852. And this was one of the professors in the medical school. How would you like to be in his class? Doesn't he look pretty stern? Yeah, and, and word has it that he was, but the students who worked with him, Dr. Nathan Rhino Smith, a well-known American surgeon who had written books and, and, and uh, designed medical equipment and other things, the students had a lifelong affection for this man because of how he trained them and what he required them to do and how they learned with him. He would go into the, into the hospital and walk with the students around to see the patients, make the students recite the medical history of the patient they were examining. So, so he, uh, he was someone who had a, a large influence on the life of Edward Stone Street and many other students. This was one of his inventions. He called it the anterior wire splint. And it was for the long bones of the leg, broken bones of the leg. And this device was used during the Civil War by both armies, the Confederate and the Union Army. And the doctors, the, the surgeons, praised this thing for, for how well it worked and how easy it was to set up. Uh, to, to uh, deal with broken bones of the legs. And that was Nathan Rhino Smith. Well, this is the cover page of Edward Stone Street's doctoral thesis, all handwritten in his hand, that uh, I found with the help of the archivist uh, at the School of Medicine, the, the Mar University of Medicine, University of Maryland School of Medicine. Um, we uh, rummaged through all these old files. I wanted to see if I could figure out um, what was taught in the medical school when Edward Stone Street was there uh, in the early uh, 1850s. Who were, the, who were the professors? What were they teaching and learning? Uh, and uh, I, I, I was able to do that and found several documents uh, with Edward Stone Street's name in there as, as a student in the class. So this was his doctoral thesis. He reported on some of his, his clinical work uh, in the hospital. And this was bound up in a, in a volume of, of the doctoral theses for the class of 1852. And I went, I went through all those. Edwards was the only one in there that had uh, some reference to a, a surgical case, a surgical problem. All, all of them mostly focused on, on diseases and illnesses. Uh, but Edward uh, had a, a description of one of the surgical matters that, that came before him when he was there, and one where he called in Dr. Smith to help. So I'm not sure how I should say, should I say that Edward helped Dr. Smith? Or did Dr. Smith help Edward? I'm not sure, but they worked together. Then, so after medical school, class of 1852, March of 52, Edward goes home, and this little building that is now the Stone Street Museum was built while he was in Baltimore in medical school. So he comes home, and there it is, and this became his his community medical clinic for several years. And it's now the museum, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Let me go back. See, his home is in the background here, that nice federal style home. And th this is what it looked like. Quite, quite a nice place, well, on about two acres of land. And so what the doctor actually did once he acquired this home, he moved his medical practice out of that little office and into the, the ground floor of his home. You know, most doctors back then had their medical practices in their homes. So he had the ground floor here as what doctors called that was his, his surgery. And the main living level was up on the second floor and over in the dining room was over here and so forth. But that was where he would see, see patients in his home. But he continued to use that little building, at kind of his central place where he kept all his records there, records and ledgers on his patients. He had his books there. He'd, he'd do his, his writing and, and studying there and he had a little work area in the back for his chemistry and pharmacy. There were, when he started medical practice in 1852, there was no pharmacy in Rockville. 
There was no hospital in Montgomery County. Not until 1920 was there a hospital. So the pharmacy, I'll show you the pharmacy in a minute, but Dr. Dr. Stone Street actually functioned for almost 25 years, for his first 25 years or so, without a pharmacy. So he was the, he was the, uh, the physician, the surgeon, the pharmacist, the responder to accidents, the deliverer of babies, you know, kind of all things to all people for a while, until later in the century when there was a pharmacy to, to help and when some specializations were coming into vogue back then the, to whom the doctor could refer patients. But this is how he spent most of his career, most of his life, in and around about, going out into the countryside. Most, of, as best I can tell, most of his patients were, were within a, a distance of about 10 road miles. Uh, as far as the way patient I was able to find uh, was a woman in, in uh, Brookville. And so I drove that distance out Route 97, Georgia Avenue in Montgomery County. Um, it was, it was be about nine and a half road miles, today's road miles. Back then, could be, the roads were a bit different than they are today. But I have I've tried during my time researching Dr. Stone Street to kind of trek where he trod, you know, no, go, go where he went. I've, I've found the homes of some of his patients the home, old homes that still exist, and I've gone there just because I've been to his medical school and other, and other places. But this is what it looks like. It's a convertible. You put the top down uh, when it's nice weather. When it isn't, there are flaps to put around it to kind of shield it a bit from the, from the weather. But uh, no radio, no heater. He also had one of these. We know that he, if the uh, snow in the winter was too deep for the, the wheels of the buggy, he'd, he'd uh, hitch up old Grant, his horse, uh, hitch up the horse to the, to the sleigh, and off he'd go. And I get, little, get children coming into the museum and we talk about this, and I said, yeah, he had, a, he had a, an open sleigh pulled by one horse. And the kids stop and think about that for a minute. You mean a one horse opens? Yes. <laughs> and this is where he spent a lot of time. Montgomery County in the uh, 19th century, was mostly farmland. About two thirds of the land in the county was, was farmland. And the other third was the, the little burbs scattered all about. And uh, the history tells us that about the turn of the century, about the year 1900 or so, uh, almost 90% of the population of Montgomery County lived in the rural parts of the county, roundabout on the farms. The farm, farming was the, 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 the seat, heat of the economy back then. And today, it might, might surprise you to know that in Montgomery County, we still have more than 500 farms in the county, mostly in the, in the, the belt around, the agricultural belt that, that spur, goes around the periphery of the county, more than 500 farms yet. And you can see, I live in Rockville. But Dr. Stonshee spent a lot of time on farms, and he was used to farming accidents and the kind of things that would happen uh, on the farms, and he got called out frequently for farming accidents, for illnesses, babies being born in the farmhouse. These were uh, a couple of the, the farmers who lived on what we call today the Norbeck Road, Route 28, which goes east from Rockville uh, over toward what was, uh, for a time, a little, a little enclave called Norbeck. It's now where uh, Route 97, Georgia Avenue, and Route 28, Norbeck Road, converge. And so they, this is, they were about two to three miles east of Rockville. This is Caroline and Roger Farquhar. Farquhar is an old name in Montgomery County. There's still Farquhars around. And there's a Farquhar Middle School and so forth. So th these were, and they were, they were Quakers. They were educated, intelligent. They, they raised their children to be the same. And both were detailed uh, journalists. They kept a diary. Every day, and it, I, I found the diaries in the, the Historical Society's archives, and Roger's piece of it was 56 years, every day he would write about whatever. He'd write about what was going on on the farm, what was happening in politics, oh, I met President Garfield today. He'd write about the illnesses. He'd write about when the baby was born and when he sent for the doctor. It was through the details of his diaries that I learned a lot about the medical practice of Edward Stone Street. 
and when he was called, how long it took him. Well, he, Roger would say it was, it was 12, 15 a.m. And I, I, I sent Johnson to get Dr. Stone Street because the baby is coming. And he'd note that. And he'd note what time the doctor arrived. And then he'd talk about what happened after that. So I got a good piece of information about how long it took for the doctor to respond to some situations like this. Or when there were accidents on the farm, they'd send for the doctor. When Roger had a business associate coming out to look at his stock, one time a business associate took ill, they sent for the doctor. So he would take care of business there too. So he spent a lot of times on the farms, helping the farmers. These are the four youngest children of Caroline and Roger Farquhar. This fellow up here is Roger Jr. And he's the man who took care of his father and mother's diaries and donated them to the Historical Society. I think it was in the, around about the 1960s when he did that. And thank you, Roger, for doing that. It's been, it's just, it's local history. The, the diaries are local history. This was the pharmacy in Rockville when it opened in 1878, it didn't look quite so elaborate, but it was a successful pharmacy. And the, the pharmacist, you can see this here, Owens, D. F. Owens, Daniel F. Owens, MD, uh, built this brand new building. And, and it just wowed the citizens of Rockville. And on the up, upper level is, is an open room, and that's where the Montgomery County Medical Society met for many years, above uh, Owens Pharmacy. But look at this, look at this thing. What, what goes on here? Well, we've got ready mix paints and varnishes and brushes, toilet article stationery, window glass, uh, trusses, books. Oh, and oh, by the way, we have medicines and drugs. Does that sound familiar? It started a long time ago. And then this event. And Edward Stone Street, this is Edward in 1867. It's the oldest or the youngest photo I have of him, 1867. So he would have been 37 years old in this photo, a couple of years after the war. Um, he, he had been in practice for 10 years from 1852 to 1862 when he was called into service. And what, um, a couple of people are, are, are important here in, in this regard. This man was an army surgeon. His name was, was Roberts Bartolo. And he was a, uh, a well-known uh, surgeon. He had lots of experience in many, many ways and many venues for the U.S. Army. And he was, in the 18, six, early 1860s, uh, he was assigned to the Surgeon General's office, uh, Surgeon General Hammond for the Union Army in Washington. And they were, Hammond and Bartolo and some others were concerned about some of the medical practices in the Army and the standardization of things. And so Hammond um, instructed Bartolo to rewrite the Army manual for how surgeons should examine uh, recruits, you know, the physical exam for when you're drafted or when you enlist and how, how to do that, how detailed to be, and how to examine um, a, either a wounded or ill patient who might be uh, suitable for discharge because of the wounding, discharge or not. So Bartolo got the manuals, the, the ones that had preceded that the Army had, and he got some manuals from some of the armies in Europe, and he took the best, and he rewrote the whole thing. This is a copy of it. A manual of instructions for enlisting and discharging soldiers. And it's, it's, it's magnificent and very detailed uh, and, and uh, very helpful. So the reason I bring this up is that uh, one of the, the roles that Edward Stone Street had uh, just preceded this event, and, and that was in the summer and early fall of 1862. And in... Uh, just preceding that, President Lincoln issued a draft of young men into the army. You know, when, the, when, the, when the, that little skirmish started that became the Civil War, um, many people thought, well, this, this little revolt isn't gonna last long. You know, it's a few months maybe. But then of course it went on and on and on. And uh, Mr. Lincoln issued a, a draft. They needed men in, in the military. So he issued a very unpopular draft of young men into the army. 
Um, and the requirements for the draft went to the states. The states put it down to the counties. The counties supplied the men. So Montgomery County was one of those. And Edward Stone Street was one of two surgeons, physicians, they called them surgeons, uh, who was uh, the examining surgeon for Montgomery County. He was one of the doctors who was doing the physical exams to see if these recruits and draftees were suited for the life of a soldier. That's an important consideration, which Edward Stone Street took very seriously. And uh, we, we estimate that Edward Stone Street probably in the, in examined about 800 men during the time from probably uh, July, August, September or so, plus or minus, uh, in uh, 1862, about 800 men. The other, he and the other doctor who were doing this for Montgomery County it was estimated that they could have examined uh, about a quarter of the eligible male population in Montgomery County at the time. That was the intensity of the draft and the seriousness of what was going on. So Edward Stone Street took all that very seriously. And Roberts Bartolo, the man who wrote the manual, uh, was a, a classmate of Edward Stone Street, School of Medicine class of 1852. So they knew each other. So Edward had some, some good help on what to do and how to do it and, and to do it properly so that uh, it, was, it was done with, with good, good science, good medicine, and with, with some sincerity and some concern for the, for the soldiers or for the, for the recruits. You know, one of the requirements was that you had to examine the recruit stripped so you could really understand what it was he was about. They had to move around to get the heart going doctor could watch and see how he was doing. And all this was kind of delicate. And the manual talked about this with the surgeon said, you know, this is going to be delicate. And whatever you find with this person, you know, what, what, it's like what we say today, what, what happens in this room stays in this room. And that was, they were instructing the surgeons on how to do this in a delicate manner. So this, the Battle of Antietam, September 17, uh, 1862. Uh, the bloodiest single day of wartime in American history, which this museum can help you really understand. This man was Bennett Clements. Uh, he was a, an old friend of Edward Stone Street. They were schoolboys together. He was from Gaithersburg. Edward was from Rockville. Uh, he was an army surgeon uh, when the war broke out, and he was stationed in Georgetown. He was in charge of, of the army. Come on in, folks. He was in charge of the Army hospitals uh, in Georgetown, uh, most of which were makeshift hospitals, the Army taking over public buildings and hotels. One of the hotels in Georgetown that became a hospital, I think, was called the Union Hotel. And the Union Hotel, Army Hospital, was the place where Louisa May Alcott was a nurse. The famous writer was a nurse, and she wrote about that after the war, being a nurse during the Civil War. And we could talk about that. So Bennett Clements was Edward Stone Street's friend. And when the, when the, when the Battle of Antietam happened, both armies were overwhelmed with the, with the number of, of wounded and the casualties. They weren't really entirely prepared for it then. But Clements, uh, working with the Surgeon General's office, who was looking for help, said, I know a guy in Rockville. I know, Ed, Ed, Dr. Edward Stone Street in Rockville. He's a qualified doctor. He's already been working under our requirements doing physical exams on the, on the draftees and the recruits. So he knows what's going on and he's, he's well qualified. And so I did this after learning about Bennett Clements and, and the Civil War and I went to the archives downtown to get the, the, the surgeon's files to see if I could find out exactly what was going on and what, what Bennett Clements was doing with Edward Stone Street to get him in to help the army with the medical needs. So I went to the, the archives and uh, requested the Civil War surgeon's file. I, f I found notation to it uh, for Edward Stone Street and this cart was wheeled out to me sitting in this room with a big table with all the original documents all the original stuff, it kind of just gave me shivers. And I've got a couple of them here I want to show you, just because. And th this, this rather shows the intensity of what was going on and how quickly things needed to be done. So this was September 24, 1862, a week after the Battle of Antietam. 
when the wounded had taken over the city. One vast hospital, you've probably read about here, the city of, of Frederick became an, an army hospital for both Union and Confederate. So anyway, so whoops, what happened here? What did I do? Yeah. Got the slides, or you can see every slide here now. <laughs> and we may do this later too to show, but go back to here, this one that's framed. That's it, we hope. Thank you. I did something here, I just set that down. So September 24, B.A. Clements, uh, uh, B.A. Clements, Assistant Surgeon, USA, United States Army, introducing friend, Dr. Stone Street. And then his note, Ben Clements writes this note to the Surgeon General's office, doctor, uh, I beg leave to introduce to, you, to your acquaintance my friend, Dr. Edward Stone Street of Rockville, Rockville, Maryland. He has business relating to the hospital department in his town. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, B.A. Clements. And he copies a man named Smith, J. 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 R. Smith at the bottom. So he, the business relating to the hospital department was that Edward Stone Street was doing the physical exams for Montgomery County. So this is the note that Clements writes to the Surgeon General's office, and then look what happens. This note gets written upon, Edward Stone Street goes and meets all these, gets interviewed and tested and whatever, and they just keep writing on this piece of paper that uh, Clements had produced. So up here it says, to get this straight here, because it's a bit hard to read. It says, respectfully referred to Surgeon Abbott, medical director for such action as he may seem Proper, signed by Joseph R. Smith, surgeon, deputy surgeon general. Off he goes. What happens next? Well, keep on going down here. They're, they're, they're saving paper, I think. This one says, respectfully recommend that a contract be made, if practicable, with Dr. Stone Street to render service in Rockville, and that he be ordered to report to me, R.O. Abbott acting medical director, Army. He was with the Army of the Potomac for a while, but now he's in the medical director's office. Abbott, so he's seen a couple different people now, and this is Abbott, which is this man, R.O. Abbott, a distinguished uh, Army uh, medical officer who had, had seen service around about the country, and then came to D.C. and was, was into the Surgeon General's office and was put in charge of all the Army hospitals in and around Washington. Washington became a hospital center for the Union Army, partly because of transportation, roadways going into the city, roadways, railroad, and the harbor in Georgetown. So this is Abbott. Now Abbott is respectfully referred to Surgeon Abbott. So what happens next? The contract comes out. And this, this was the standard kind of contract that the Army made with civilian physicians to bring them into service. So this is dated contract the 24th day of September 1862, Washington, D.C., between Brigadier General William A. Hammond of the U.S. Army and Dr. E.E. E. Stone Street of Rockville. And you can see the rest of it. But this is what got Edward Stone Street uh, into Army service. And, but they sent him back to Rockville. Now, I don't recall there was any Battle of Rockville during the Civil War. So what was going on? in Rockville that the army needed him to be there. Well, here we go again, more handwritten orders. This one says, let me get this right here, Stone Street EE, e., Acting Assistant Surgeon, U.S. Army. To proceed to Rockville, Maryland and take charge of all sick, wounded, and stragglers now there and that may arrive, report their condition and how many can be removed to Washington? September 24, 1862. What was going on was the aftermath of the Battle of Antietam where the city of Frederick was one vast hospital and the army was moving out, taking with them their surgeons. And so all these, all these wounded in, in uh, Frederick needed uh, a place for long-term care. 
And it was late in 1862 and early in 63 when the Army, U.S. Army, was building brand new state-of-the-art Army hospitals. And I've got, I'll show you a couple of those here. Um, and they were mostly in and around the cities. Uh, and, and for us in this area, they were in Baltimore, in D.C., Georgetown, and across the river in Alexandria, Virginia. The brand new long-term medical care for the, for the wounded. You know, before the Civil War, it was not uncommon for a hospital to be a place where someone went to die. During the Civil War, hospitals became places for, for, for recovery. And when, when the wounded went through the hospital system uh, here in Frederick, um, and surviving that, I think the mortality rate was something like 9%. You might check that. They've probably got some better stats here on that. But it was, the survival rate was really, really quite good. And of all the soldiers who went through the Army medical system with, with bullet wounds, which was the major reason they were in the hospitals, their mortality rate was 14%. So it means their survival rate, you know, do the math. For those soldiers who went through the hospital system either with or requiring amputations for whatever reason, their mortality rate was about 26%. Three quarters survived. That's not quite what we envisioned about medicine during the Civil War. There was a lot of gruesomeness, but they, they, uh, they learned a lot. And all things considered, under the conditions that these surgeons had to work under, they actually did remarkably well. So anyway, Edward Stone Street then is sent back. He sent home to Rockville. This was the courthouse that existed in Rockville at the time. It was built, built around 1840, a two-story building with some one-story wings and some outbuildings around it, about two acres of land. The Army took over the courthouse in Rockville and turned it into a 350-bed temporary Army General Hospital. And as you saw in one of those handwritten notes, Edward Stone Street was put in charge. Go back and take care of the wounded that are there now or that may come there. And what happened was, uh, as the soldiers, the wounded were, were moving out of Frederick, going to these other places, there were some new hospitals in and around Washington and a convalescent camp and a convalescent hospital in Alexandria, Virginia. Go to Georgetown, cross the river to Alexandria for long-term care of the wounded and the surviving wounded. So they were moving all around. And so a number of these wounded um, were heading south to Rockville. Some went by, by rail. And a bunch went, let me see here, a bunch went like this, with these brand new state-of-the-art uh, army ambulances. And you, you can see a rendition of this in one of the tableaus here. It's a magnificent thing. And, and, the, and these were staffed by, uh, by uniformed soldiers whose job was to drive this, this, this ambulance. And many of them went out onto the battlefield. You know, the idea was go find the wounded uh, and Get them in the name and get them to medical care as quickly as possible. This concept of, of rapid transport of wounded, and it started during the Civil War. You know, today, when we have a, a problem, what happened? You know, 911, you get help within a few minutes. If you're out on the highway in a crash, the helicopter comes in. That's all started by what, what, what the Army gleaned during the Civil War. And so this is one of the ways that, that the wounded got to Rockville. I'm going to read you a little piece here, one of the historical documents. Uh, from Rockville history, talks about what happened uh, after the Battle of Antietam. Just a little paragraph here. After the bloody battle at Antietam Creek on September 17, 1862, which killed 4,000 Americans and injured 18,000 more, you find the stats here maybe a little different here, the entire countryside was called upon to assist the wounded from both armies. Horse-drawn ambulances delivered casualties to Rockville. One observer wrote, the extensive grounds of the courthouse were soon occupied by the soldiers who had fallen out from the commands, and many sick soldiers were already in the rooms of the courthouse, lying upon the bare floor. The writer of this was with the, the U.S. Christian Commission, and he says, I was dispatched with the army wagon to farmhouses to get a load of straw, and later for a couple of sheep to be slaughtered for soup. This member of the Christian Commission also held an impromptu religious service under the trees in front of the courthouse. So here's this courthouse, 150 beds, 
serving the wounded as they were in transit by this method from Rockville heading in toward the federal city and some going across the river. Now there was, there's a, a great book which you can find here written by Terry Reimer, one of the staff people here. It's called One Vast Hospital. And it explains how the city of Frederick was taken over by the armies right, uh, at, at and, and after the Battle of Antietam and where all the soldiers were, all the churches that were used. And it explains all that here. And then in the back, it lists 9,000 wounded and who they were and what was going on with them and how they were wounded, what company they were, what unit they were with, and where they were going when they left uh, Frederick. And there's a bunch of them here. I counted more than 700 in here who were headed to Washington and another 190 or something uh, that were gonna cross the river to Alexandria for the long-term care that the army was providing in these new state-of-the-art hospitals. So as they're heading south, one of the places they stopped when they needed medical care was at Edward Stone Street's uh, courthouse hospital where they could render I interim care. They called these, these, these wounded the living wounded and, and they needed care. They, they probably had a lot of follow-up surgeries and whatever they needed. And so Edward Stone Street worked in that hospital. The army ran that hospital from, from uh, just after the Battle of Antietam in September of 62 and closed it in uh, the end of January of 63. By that time they didn't need that hospital and the wounded from Antietam had already gone to wherever they were gonna be for their, their long-term care and recovery. So just looking a bit at that idea of um, rapid transport, which was a, a great concept. You know, during the Civil War, a couple of the new things that happened was the, the concept of a, an ambulance corps of, of uniformed soldiers. Find the wounded and get them to a doctor. One of the, the field hospitals and you saw how that was done, one of the ways that was done. Well, as we get into the early 20th century, a, a piece of that rapid transport looked like this, probably World War I era. During Korea, Second World War in Korea, a piece of that rapid transport looked like this. During the Korean War, a piece of it looked like this. You remember the MASH TV show? And who was the guy who could hear him coming when nobody else could? Yeah, radar. Yep, a couple of wounded for, for really rapid transport. A great concept during Korea, which morphed into this during Vietnam with the, 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 uh, the Huey helicopter, the workhorse of the military. You still see these flying around today. The state of Maryland actually uh, used a, a couple of these uh, in the early 1970s for, uh, for uh, flying wounded from, from accident scenes to hospitals. And then today, in the military, it looks a bit like this. I think that's a Black Hawk helicopter. Anybody yep. correct me on that? Yeah? 60. Black Hawk. Thank you. Yes, with, with some of the, the uh, Army medics. And then today, there's the, this is the uh, state of Maryland's air ambulance. Um, that, that is a, it, it's, it's a uh, sort of kind, it's life support mm -hmm. when you're flying. It's not just transport, but life support. And uh, um, we see this, see this around in Montgomery County, one of the trauma centers is at Suburban Hospital in Bethesda. And when this is heading there, it's, it's really interesting to see it because they, they fly low, not too high above the treetops, and they just haul. I mean, it's just, just like in Vietnam where the, where the Hueys were just flying low and fast. They're harder to shoot when they're low and fast. When they're up high, you get more time. But anyway, they, they haul. I was in the museum, the Stone Street Museum, one afternoon as the docent of the day, and a man came in um, to see the museum was by himself, and he was really interested in the Civil War. So we've got a, a little Civil War display, not like here, but you know enough to help the docents to help him understand. And we got to talking about it. We have one of the, the uh, uh, amputation kits from the Civil War in, in a display case, and he looked and he said, oh, I've got one of those. It was my great-great-grandfather's. He was a Civil War surgeon. I've got his, his uh, kit. And he says, you see that really long knife the one on the end there, the really long one, he said, that knife is still sharp. And it's the one I used to carve the turkey at Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, me too. But when he was in there and we were talking about the Civil War, I, I, I was talking to him about this, the concept of, of uh, rapid transport, you know, the ambulance corps picking up the wounded and getting them to help quickly. 
just as we were talking about that, this helicopter goes cruising right over the, right over the, the museum, just a little bit above the treetops. And it, it, it gave, gave us shivers. I said, well, I couldn't have planned that. But there you go, that, that came from the Civil War. Say what you will about medicine in the Civil War, say thank you for that. Well, a little bit about Army hospitals. I want to keep us on time here. During the latter 1862 and in the early 63 and so, the Army was building these new large uh, Army hospitals for long-term care, convalescence and long-term care. And they had this idea about having all these wards scattered about and all connected so that uh, patients with like conditions could be treated together. Yeah, and, and an idea of helping both the patients and the surgeons to take care of business. And so they had some design kind of like this. It looked like this was one, Satterley General Hospital in Philadelphia. Here, here come the army ambulances coming in with the wounded. And they'd come in here and they'd be triaged and then decide where they're going, which, which wards would be appropriate for them. All the central facilities here, central facilities would be an administration building. They can see the, looks like they maybe have a, a chapel here and uh, the kitchen, laundry, and all that for a full service hospital. And then it looks like the hospital staff is probably tenting around the outside there. This is one of the concepts I'm gonna show you here. This one is the Mower General Hospital in the, what is now Chestnut Hill in Philadelphia. This was a grand example of a new state-of-the-art army hospital. And you see there's a rail, there's a rail line down, it's hard to see it here, but there's a rail line down here that can bring the wounded in. There's, there's the, the roadway for the army ambulances. And this is the, this is the entrance to the hospital here uh, and uh, all these different wards and then all the central support facilities in the middle. And I'll show you some of those. Uh, but when, the next couple of photos, next photo we're gonna be standing right here at the entrance to the hospital. There we are with a two-story building where the, the, the wounded come in and where they're triaged, where they get examined by the surgeons who are then you know, figuring out what, how, how can we help this guy and where do we put him? And so when you're looking at this, and, and if, if the wounded couldn't walk, they could be taken in by cart or whatever, or the ambulance can pull in, pull in that way. Now in the couple, next couple of pictures, we're gonna see there's a, there's a stack here and a, and a flag here. I wanna go back. Here's that stack, and here's the flag. And here's another uh, look at that, the entrance to the hospital being right here along the roadway. Now look at these old army buildings. Just get a mental picture of these, these uh, 1860s army buildings. I'm gonna show you some others like this in a, in a second here. But there we are at the entrance to the hospital. Now this is, this is inside that open area in the hospital, and here's the flag. This is, looks like a little parade ground and a cupola. They probably did some concerts and things here. And there's a garden here, I'll show you this garden. And then the wards all around, like the spokes of a wheel. And this is an, another view inside. And this is the round connecting structure with all the hospital wards fanning out. This is probably where a number of the hospital workers lived. And this is a, a view of the administration building in that central area. Here's that cupola and flag again in the open area. Um, this is the administration building. I'll show you a little bit of that. And then this little structure here. Oops, there we go. A little, a little close up uh, and with the administration building. And then this structure here is labeled as quarters of the surgeon in charge. So the surgeon in charge has his own space and it looks like he might even uh, tend a garden out here behind just because, you know, a little place to go out and just chill after what you're going through here. And these two buildings are also inside. Uh, this one is the guard house, if needed. And this one is the lecture hall, which it's got the uh, lighting up at the top here for sunlight coming in so the doctors can get together and compare notes or talk, whatever they need to do, have lectures and, and share what's going on in, in the hospital. And this is the fire brigade. Look at this. It's hard to see this here, but there's a stream of water up here 
from all these hoses, they're, they're practicing. And in some of these large state-of-the-art hospitals, the people who would do this sometimes were the invalid corps, they called them for a while. And these were wounded soldiers in the hospital who were on the mend and were capable of taking on some duties. You know, they're not ready to go back to their, their, their brigade yet, but they could, they could be helpful in the hospital. And one of the ways they could do that was being part of the fire brigade. Now, where did the, where did the water come from? How, how, how'd they do that? Oops, well, there was a water tank just outside the hospital to, to provide water for the, for the fire brigade. And also, this hospital had plumbing, had indoor plumbing. I'll show you that in a minute. This is a, a look inside the uh, administration building where they're keeping all the records on all those soldiers, which now we can find through the National Archives and wherever. It's hard to see this here, but these lamps, this is gas lighting coming down over here, gas lights. So it's got plumbing and gas lighting. No air conditioning, I don't think. And this is in one of the wards. This looks like they prepared for a photograph here. They're all looking pretty spiffy. And on, and on the mend, and you can see again here, the, the gas lighting coming, coming in from the ceiling. Got one of the wards in the hospital. And then this is that central walk, walk that goes all around where all the, the, the wards are, are fanning out from. This is a look in there. Let me back up here a little bit. It looks like this. And it's got this little rail track for, for rail cars, pushing probably, uh, for moving supplies, uh, for moving food to soldiers probably, or maybe even for moving a uh, wounded or somebody to a, a new ward or to a surgical center. And you can see here also, there's a, a drinking space. It's hard to see it over here, but they had water pumped in though, and all these benches, so maybe it looks like if the soldiers can do it and they need a little, you know, let's get up and move, they can walk all the way around through here and find places to sit, have a water drinking station there to help them out. Th this, is, this is a state-of-the-art hospital in the United States of America. And this is labeled as the cooking department. This is a view of the kitchen, one of the views of the kitchen that provides all the food for the patients and the workers and everyone. And we're, we're gonna, gonna walk down to the other end, turn around and take another photo of the cooking department is the way it was labeled. So a full, full service kitchen, a big full service kitchen to, to, for this hospital. Now, remember the, that building I showed you to look at those old army buildings in the 1860s? Well, this was Fort Gordon, Georgia in the 1960s. Look at those buildings. And the, yeah, these recruits are mustering up in their company. If we, could, if we could make this a color photo and change all this khaki to blue or gray, you might think it was the Civil War. The army had these hospitals they designed and these buildings they used. And once you had something that worked, you kept doing it. You kept making it, if, as long as it's working for you. So this was Fort Gordon. Here's another, some young heroes during the Vietnam era in Fort Gordon, Georgia. Look at those army buildings. Well, a couple more here because I'm going to get you to a, a place here. These are a couple that were in, in Philadelphia. This one, I think, was, was out in, in uh, Paoli, whatever, an army hospital. But this is like the 1950s. And this was Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Army Hospital. Didn't change too much in looks. In medicine, yes, but maybe not in looks so much. And then there's this one. This was uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. This is where I was stationed. I was, uh, I was drafted in 1966, and being a young biologist right out of college, uh, I was um, assigned to the Army Medical Service and posted to Fort, Fort Campbell. Fort Campbell was then and still is the home of the 101st Airborne Division. So this is the Army Hospital. This is the headquarters of it. These are the, this is the clinical building where I work. This is bachelor officer's quarters. All of these hospital wards and the barracks over here where we lived. The water tower down there, so we have running water. So this was the Army Hospital uh, in, in the 1960s. It looked like this. They brick facaded it by that time, but it's that same army design. 
that was replaced in 1982 by a new modern uh, medical center in, in Fort Campbell. Fort Campbell is located um, on the, right on the border between Kentucky and Tennessee. The nearest place you've know, probably heard of is Nashville. So this is the new medical center, 1982. So from the time the Army started building these state-of-the-art hospitals in 1862 until Fort Campbell took that design down and rebuilt it was 120 years that design worked for the Army. And Fort Campbell, that one I showed you, uh, occupied 73 acres and it had seven miles of hallways and corridors. It was unbelievable. And that's what lasted for 120 years that the Army created during the Civil War. And it worked for the Army for all that time. Well, then this happened. Uh, this is back to Edward Stone Street again uh, in Rockville. Uh, when his hospital at the courthouse closed in, in the late January of 63, then he went back to his private practice. But then in, in February of 63, he was called into service again uh, one of the, the company, Company M, of the 6th Michigan Cavalry Regiment was in, in, uh, in Rockville. The, 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 the Cavalry Regiment, there are four regiments of the Michigan Brigade that were in and around Washington, helping to defend the federal city. So Company M is out around Rockville, and they have some really sick soldiers. And they know about Edward Stone Street, so he gets called into service again to help the 6th the Michigan. Uh, and he did that until late in June of 63. Late in June of 63, um, the Confederate Army crossed the Potomac River. Potomac River was the dividing line between North and South for military purposes, and they were headed North. So the Army of Potomac is hot on his heels, you know, hot on, on General Lee's heels. So the Michigan Brigade and all the others packed up, wounded or not, off they went to to follow the, the Confederate Army North. And of course, they rendezvoused, they met in Gettysburg for a, for a very important battle. So, what happens here? When the 6th Michigan needs help from Dr. Stone Street, here we go again, you know, here we go. Detachment of the 6th Michigan Cavalry Regiment in Rockville, a Harvey H. Vinton, captain in command of the detachment of the 6th Michigan, uh, makes a contract with Edward Stone Street again for medical attention to this command. Very informal, but important enough to be archived by the National Archives and contained in the Civil War Surgeon's file of how things were done sometimes. Well, so after the war, after this, in uh, June of 63, as far as I knew, that was the end of Edward's uh, helping the army and he goes, re returns to his medical practice. This is 1877, I believe. And one of his patients back then, in the late 1800s, was this man, Colonel Henry Martin Robert. He had been a, a Civil War veteran. This is the 1890s. And Colonel Robert is now one of the three commissioners that uh, governed Washington, D.C. Before the mayor and council idea, um, the, the Washington was governed by a triumvirate of three commissioners, one of whom had to be an Army engineer. So he's the, he's the U.S. Army engineer, was the engineering district of Washington. Colonel Robert was the, the uh, district engineer. And he was a, a stellar um, military person. Uh, he had been involved with uh, helping to design the defenses of Philadelphia Harbor, the defenses of Washington and had uh, been uh, in, in the service for a long time. But in the, when he was in Washington in the 1890s, his, he had malaria that kept recurring. When he was a young officer in Panama, many years before he had contracted malaria. And every now and then it would, would come back. And he was under such stress in his job that it would flare up. And um, Robert had the family in Rockville. And so he would go out to Rockville and Dr. Stone Street was helping him. And this was the Washington Post, September 14, uh, 1890. If you have a Montgomery County library card, you can use the number on the back and go online and search the old Washington Post sitting at your desk, keyword searchable back to the 1870s. 
So I found some of this. A letter was received yesterday from the wife of Colonel Robert, stating that he was much better. Dr. Stone Street of Rockville has been attending Colonel Robert during his sickness, says that the Colonel will be able to transact some business tomorrow. And this went on from the fall of 1890 to the spring of 91, where Robert was just having a hard time. Dr. Stone Street finally said, you need to get out of town for a few days, for a few weeks, calm down, recover, take your medicines and do all that. And apparently he did, Robert did that and was much better. So he had a stellar military career. Military people know about Colonel Robert, but the rest of us, this is what he's really known for. Robert's rules of order. Henry Martin Robert hated going to meetings where nothing happened, no, no, nothing's resolved, nobody goes away with, with tasks to do. They said, this is just not working. So he comes up with this little manual. I have a copy here if you want to see it. Uh, this little manual was sold a million copies and we still use it today. My church in Bethesda still uses Robert's Rules of Order for its business meetings. And so Henry Martin Robert, one of Dr. Stone Tree's patients. This was Admiral Stevens, uh, who was, uh, when he retired in the 1890s or so, he was commander of the Pacific Fleet. And yeah, and, and uh, he had been uh, uh, commander of one of the, the, uh, of the ironclads during the Civil War. And he had a home in Rockville. And so he was one of Dr. Stone Street's patients. Both Admiral Stevens and uh, Henry Martin Robert are, are buried in, in Arlington. Oops. Dr. Stone Street's burial place in Rockville with the headstones. I have offered some programs from inside there around Halloween, being the, the spirit of Edward Stone Street. Not trying to be spooky or scary, but but it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful place. And so, sometimes, it might sound a little strange, and I, you know, but sometimes uh, I go there. Just park, park the car and walk up just to be there by Edward Stone Street. And I think we, our time is pushing it here, so I think we'll just end here. But this is the Stone Street Museum of 19th Century Medicine. We're on the Civil War trails. Uh, circuit in the several states that, that do that. This is the Civil War Trails marker outside which talks about country doctor and army surgeon. And I think we'll, we'll stop there so we'll keep you on time and there's a lot to see in this wonderful little place. Uh, there's a few handouts up here if you want. This is Dr. Stone Street's biography. I think they, this may be available in the, the museum shop downstairs. Uh, if you're interested in that. Talk, it'll give you everything you ever wanted to know about all this and a couple of other things, which you're welcome to have. And uh, Chris, I think maybe we'll end it here. If you're... Does anyone have any questions? Um, what's, where all the medical facilities are you show? What's there now? All housing developments or something? Where now? Up in PA, the original hospital you showed. Oh, yeah. Chestnut Hill, where that one hospital was, is one of the uh, nicer neighborhoods just outside Philadelphia right now. Yeah, there's no, nothing rem remembering that. But I think that after the war, when the Army finished with that hospital, it, it stayed there for, for, for several years being used by the city. But it was probably a little bit more than they really needed. They didn't need 2,000 beds and, and all that, but been replaced, of course. Yes, sir? Yes, triage was known before the Civil War, but not used so much. It was during the war, it really found a place. And when the, when the ambulance corps would pick up uh, a wounded soldier on or near the battlefield or whatever, they would take him to an aid station, which was nearby, maybe within rifle shot, but you know, trying to hide behind whatever, uh, where, where the wounded would, would first meet uh, an army uh, physician, an army surgeon. And they would uh, do some, what we might, call today some, some first aid to, to maybe get the bleeding stopped or maybe bandage up, maybe even give them some, a bit of uh, uh, pain medication. Uh, but then they would do, perform the, uh, a, a first round of triage and deciding who do we need to get back on that ambulance and go to the field hospital where the surgeons are for, for you know, where if he needs, he needs surgical help. Who, who do we do that? And who can wait? and you know, eventually get there, and who among these wounded um, might we say we know we can't help them? 
and we'll, we'll do the best we can with them under the shade of the trees. We'll manage their pain as best we can, let them die with as much dignity as we can find here. Some, that might have happened at or near the, the uh, aid station, but also near the field hospital. If you remember that old TV show, MASH, the, that was the field hospital where the surgeons were. And every now and then, Hawkeye, the surgeon, would get called to go to the, the, the battalion aid station, right there near the, near the, the fighting, because they needed some help. So it was the aid station, the field hospital, and then the general hospital, three-tiered hospital system. You know, so they would triage what happened there. When they got to the field hospital where the surgeons were, things could have changed. They might do another bit of triage there. So get that guy into the surgery right now, or let him wait. You know, that, so it was something that was, was helpful. And you may remember seeing Hawkeye do that when the wounded had come in with the, with the vehicles on the, on the trucks. They'd be out lying out there in front of the, 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 the surgical center and, and triage. Hawkeye and the others would be out there deciding what to do with whom when. And that was a concept that really happened uh, in, in earnest during the Civil War. Triage, rapid transport of the wounded, um, uh, uh, an ambulance corps, a three-tiered hospital system, uh, the use of, uh, of uh, pain medication, uh, and uh, general anesthesia. Soldiers were not awake and biting on bullets during the Civil War. General anesthesia was the was the mark of the day, ether or chloroform. The, the modern look back uh, recently has told us that depending on the, the situation, somewhere between 95 and maybe 99% of the surgery done by both armies for four years was done under general anesthesia. So what happened to the other 5%? Why, why wasn't it used there? Well, maybe the man was, was unconscious and we'll just take care of it. Or maybe it was something minor and we can use some local anesthesia or, or maybe we'll just do it you know we'll just do it but in general when I was researching Edward Stone Street and I went to the archives in Baltimore to see what was going on in the 1850s when he was the med student I, I, I found that he was being tutored by that wonderful surgeon Smith but uh, uh, general anesthesia w was not in the curriculum when I went back again to look and see what was going on following the war. By 1867, two years after the war, it was in the, in, in the surgical curriculum. So the Civil War had, a, had an effect on that and, and what, what was going on in the medical schools and in the medical community. And some of those young doctors, when they went home, they took back with them some things they learned in the Army, like general anesthesia. I think that's what probably happened to Edward Stone Street. Yes? Well, we know the infection rate though, of the 600,000 now, though I've seen some figures that are saying maybe, maybe the, the death during the Civil War was closer to 700,000. You can ask the staff here to correct me on that. Uh, but it was about, about uh, two to one, two third, two to one for people dying of disease and contagion and infection and not understanding the, the bacteria and, you know, uh, versus dying from, uh, from, from wounding. You know, during the time of the Civil War, um, Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister in Europe were working, you know, Pasteur was working with, with the microorganisms for many different things. And Lister was a surgeon who couldn't control the infection in his surgical ward until he and pa Pasteur got together and fi fixed it. And it was after the war when that really came, 1867, when Lister published his paper about doing surgery without infection and how to do that. Changed, it changed the, the life of medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy Frederick today and this wonderful institution.